Namaskar. I am Ashok Vyaz and in today's Insight Tonight with Ashok Vyaz, we are going to be meeting uh, Professor Sachi Dastidhar and he is founder of uh, Probini Foundation which was founded uh, almost uh, 25 years ago and he has also been instrumental uh, in uh, establishing another important organization, Indian Subcontinent Partition Documentation Project which is uh, called uh, ISPAD. But today what brings him uh, to our studios is uh, the new wealth, uh, the new treasure uh, in the form of the book called Mukti, Free to be Born Again. And the subtitle goes, Partitions of Indian Subcontinent, Islamism, Hinduism, Leftism and Liberation of the Faithful. A process of welcome. Namaskar. Namaskar. Thank you for inviting me. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you and every year, um, of course, uh, year begins with January and on 26th January, we look at India in a special way, celebrating uh, Republic Day of India. Of course. So, it is apt to go back, look at the history and how we have arrived, where we have arrived and how much suffering is also a part of our history, which is many times not known to many people and especially as uh, we talk about uh, your book uh, where you are referring to partitions of Indian subcontinent. Uh, tell me uh, the idea because this book has taken almost 18 years for you uh, to complete. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, sure, maybe 18 plus probably. But in between we had, I had other books, other projects come up. But the idea came about my, by the way, my, comes way back. Because my family were refugee, they were evicted from our ancestral land, um, as was my wife. So almost all extended family were driven out um, of what we fell on the wrong side, uh, which was uh, on the East, East Bengal, uh, which became East Pakistan and then Bangladesh. Um, and they were also, on the other hand, they were very, very uh, prominent nationalist. Uh, my grandfather was a lawyer and grandma, uh, grandma and two uncles spent years and years behind bars uh, just for activism, pa pacifist activism. Many were uh, associate of the Gandhiji. But, but after we, I am the first person to go back to our ancestral land. Um, then my uh, eyes. Allow me to interrupt you. Just when you say nationalist, your grandfather's were, grandfather was a nationalist, mm -hmm. and we're talking about the United India at that right, time because right, right, there was right. no Pakistan at the time. Right, right, but right, right That right. nationalist movement, which right, was led right. by Mahatma Gandhi, absolutely. Gali, when yeah. it was just for basically all Congress, the Congress was leading the uh, nationalist movement, and as you know, Bengal was a was a was a, was a hotbed of Indian nationalism. So from late 1800s until Indian partition. Um, and so, yes, it's for India's independence as a united India. But of course, for them, it was a rude awakening. Once India was partitioned, they became on the, fell on the wrong side. And then before partition, many people don't realize province of Bengal, the United Province of Bengal, which is today's Bangladesh and West Bengal, was ruled by Muslim League Party. Uh, so they fell on the wrong side. And then there was a wrath on them. But since my grandfather was very politically known, uh, he was given a few hours to, to flee from his home. Um, so, yes, it is the United Indian uh, Independence Movement. Do you remember how old were you at that time? No, I was, I was a, I was, no, I was, I was really product of New India. But I have gone back. I'm the first one. So once they fled, they came to Calcutta with only shirt and sari on their back. Um, and so, but I am the first person to go back to visit my, our, where they grew up, what we call the new village where they lived roughly 450 so, years. So, Professor, most of us who are watching you also, if they come from India, they were towards, as you said, wrong side, they were towards the right side. So, if you were in that part of Punjab, which was in India, as is in India, or from Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh. You yeah. don't know actually what is the meaning yeah. of partition. Many of us uh, have uh, never actually encountered that kind of first-hand experience from many people as you from your family members and others. So, what was uh, the narrative that 
you heard as a child while you were growing up Wo, about well, their that, experiences. Yeah, yeah. Narrative was quite painful. I still remember when we were we were very young, growing up up in Calcutta. Um, I think uh, we had at at its peak in our house, rented house, three bedroom house, probably twenty five plus people. It was uncle, aunts, and 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 grandparents coming, staying there, and moving out, uh, trying to survive. Luckily, they were highly educated, uh, so they were able to find jobs wherever they could. There are people who perished also. There are people who perished. Uh, so it was struggle. I have seen through my own eyes my parents selling jewelry to send our kids to school. So it was it was thought to be normal because you have to, that's what you have to do to survive. So Professor Sajid, there are two kinds of struggle, and of course there are many kinds. But the way yeah. I'm saying it, this is an economic struggle that you need to uh, to figure out a way to take care of your family, your needs, etc. But there's another struggle which is in your mind, which is in your consciousness, which is related to the memory that you have of the suffering that yeah, you have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's why, for a very long time, if you if you grew up in Calcutta in Bengal, you'd find. Village-wide, East Bengal village-wide refugees were doing their, their, their Durga Puja associations, district associations to protect their own identity, own tradition. So, so we had that also in our village, in Calcutta, the village association, we had district association which brought in people from the district trying to, trying to keep the tradition alive. Um, so it was a hard struggle. Plus I have also visited Many of our family members also lived in what we call Jabodakhol, basically forcibly occupied uh, places where they, where they just, just established their hut, household. Um, I also visited Dandakarana where large number of oppressed caste Hindu peasants were settled. My oldest brother was a doctor, he worked there. So I visited many times, actually very recently, four years ago I also went back. Um, so. Yes, it was day-to-day -day survival. There are people, we do not know who people who perish. But, but the people who survive. On the other hand, you also had a problem in our parts. A large number of, them, of the people didn't want to talk about what they have left behind. Because it was too painful for them. But, but, uh, but I believe your book brings out some of those stories. Yes, absolutely. It, it brings out, it brings out struggle before but mostly after, after 47, uh, a number of things. One, it brings out how people who are left behind in, in Bangladesh, how they are surviving uh, or, or perishing, how even the few uh, sympathetic uh, majority Muslims are coming trying to help them, whereas others who are, who are trying to trying uh, to, to, to prosecute them or persecute them. Um, uh, so that brings out, and I also have a story uh, which I, all of this is a real life story. So I, I, I weave, it, weave it together. So you also have a story of people who wanting to go back but cannot, uh, who lost their family, family member during a pogrom, hoping that the child would come back. So parents have stayed back, hoping the child who lost they are going to come back. So, I know somebody who did that. On, uh, so, somebody who went back to Calcutta to look for their own, own family member, hoping the family member survived as a Hindu monk. Generally, monks give up their connection to the family. So, he was going from place to place looking for it. So, that story, part of the family who stays back, part of this family who is, who is in in India. So, Professor Saji, you have, uh, you have been involved in a very important and meaningful project in terms of uh, compiling uh, stories, first and experiences of uh, many, many people uh, through your organizations uh, and uh, some of it probably finds its way in this book also if yeah. uh, I uh, look at it that way. Uh, there are stories of refugees, there are stories of uh, survivors and there are stories of Protectors. Yes. Uh, talk to me a little bit about uh, what gave you the idea of uh, giving the title Mukti, free to be born again. And why not liberation? Why Mukti? Yeah. 
Actually, <coughs> should I read or should I not? You, so, please. Go so, ahead. so actually, I've heard of this term, especially in Bangladesh, of the of the minorities. They said, when should I, our pain and suffering, end? Because uh, sometimes they feel like it is it is little bit better, but then things turn turn around. So let me read a few few lines please, from please, here from please. the introduction. It says, Mukti is a product of love and pain of at least three decades. It is a byproduct of over three decades of field work, social work and travel in the partition related affected Bengal, Bangladesh, formerly East Pakistan, West Bengal, now called Pashchim Bongo of India, as well as neighboring states of Assam, Tripura, Meghalaya, Manipur, Arunachal, Nagaland, Mizoram, Odisha states, Bangladeshi, Hindu, Hindu refugees settled under Karana forest and the Andaman and Nicobar Islands in the Bay of Bengal. During my travel in Muslim majority Bangladesh, I have come across the term Mukti from many, especially indigenous pre-Islamic Hindu and lately Buddhist families as they pray for liberation from their suffering. Mukti is an often used term in Hindu, Buddhist, Jain philosophies, which means according to Bengal, Saito Shangshad, Bengali, Bengali English Dictionary, salvation, nirvana, rescue, liberation, relief, freedom from earthly attachments and more. So, so that's what it is. People, people are trying to say when should our suffering end? When should we be liberated? from this pain. So, if I just take a cue from uh, what you just said and go towards uh, Indian philosophy, Vedantic philosophy, uh, which was brought on uh, in this part of the world by Swami Vivekananda and there is a sense of oneness uh, which alone can take away fear. Uh, that is somewhere what they are saying and yeah, yeah. As, as I say it in my, my yeah, words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that is almost impossible to achieve in certain circumstances, externally at least. And yet uh, there was this sense of oneness uh, through uh, some of the singers uh, which you uh, mention in your book also and that is the tradition of Bowls. Yeah, Baul singers. Bowls is the folk singers of Bengal. Um, and they have a very long history actually. They are the ones which went, went from village to village early in the morning sometimes they will go uh, they call Pravati songs. They will sing from village to village. Wake up, wake up, um, and 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 so during Indian independence movement in the 1900s, they became a very strong instrument in 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 putting um, Indian nationalism and freedom movement into rural Bengal. And because of that, many of these people were arrested, imprisoned, and the, one of the very famous ones, whose poem I I have translated here. Is called yeah. Mukunda Das. Yeah, let me uh, sort of share some of uh, some lines of this poem, and before that, I also want to repeat what you sa just said that they they belong to both communities. Like yes. they were not restricted to Hindus or Muslims, and mm -hmm. they would sing in the praise of Lord Ra uh, Lord Krishna, uh, Radha, and then there will be songs uh, Muhammad, uh, Muhammad yeah. uh, Allah, and yeah, all. Yeah. So um, they were not confined to one community, and that. A sense of call it uh, secular nature of uh, these singers um, is evident when they're talking about uh, Mother India mm -hmm. also. Mm -hmm. So yeah. uh, I take uh, the liberty of uh, sharing this prabhati with all of you. Wake up, wake up, villagers! The sun is rising. Wake up, Sarup Katiyan. Sarup Katiyan. The name of the villagers is Sarup Kati. Wake up, Ma Kali's children. Wake up our mothers and sisters, fathers and brothers. Foreigners are stealing our treasure. Stop it! Stop it! Mother India is rising with her daughter Bangla in her arm. Wake up! Wake up! See the rising sun. So that rising sun uh, led to the stage where now we proudly celebrate 26th January um, which uh, started from 1950. Yeah. Um, did you come across uh, these singers uh, or those who were inspired by singing of these prabhatis? Oh yes, 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 yes. Actually, um, sure. Uh, actually, one of our Bengal's very famous uh, Baul singer is called Lalon. He was born Hindu but raised by a Muslim. Muslim. 
so he always talked about synthesis of both and and so there is a lalon akra akra means a place where people like an ashram where come so i visited it is in is bordering india on the close to west bengal in kushtia district so i visited that place twice so they would sing old mother india songs but also they would sing more modern or recent songs also during bangladesh liberation they were also a force in 71 when pakistan army and bengali islamists killed over 3 million people so so they were also the ones who inspired uh, rural people to 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 for 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 fighting for their rights fighting for their nation so it has a very long tradition so i think you are one of the few individuals who uh, could trace uh, their roots uh, and bring uh, and share that in a systematic manner and that happens to be your profession also so uh, just side tracking slightly history the way we have understood it many times um we come across people saying that this is the western scholar writing our history so in your case what you have presented it is also a uh, a kind of i think it is history yeah. sure so, sure, so sure. would you would you say the sensibility of the one who is telling uh, the story of a nation also comes into play when history is told sure 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 and even i myself growing up growing up in 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 calcutta <clears throat> as a very urbanist uh, often negated some of these things and we are taught and and uh, uh, our atheist friend influenced us very falsely um, trying to tell us this does didn't matter but i do think as i grow older i do think it matters but what i have also done here is the story told not from from the point of elites but from the point of view of very very poor oppressed caste people often women women are the standard bearers of our tradition uh, in all indian families hindu families um, uh, buddhist families uh, so so i have used their words because as i write in this book in the preface i had one advantage was that when i traveled uh, i traveled with my wife she is educated here she has a doctorate from united states but she is very sorry and and sindur so when you go to the villages and we also had kids with us so doors open women often open the door and welcome us if i went by myself it would not be that easy mm-hmm. so immediately they would say didi come stay with us you know and then they would share their own personal stories once the ice was broken they would they opened us to us opened us to me as a as an individual uh, so i i shared this story uh, from on the very first chapter as you see one of the one of the people whose narratives i i go around it is shubha shubha rani ghosh uh, is a is a basically uh, whose family income is no more than 150 dollars a a year for a for a family of eight so it is that kind of a person who offered me me to come and stay with them but their only bed was a torn torn sari uh um stretch on the floor and uh, and the uh, and the uh, um your um cushion uh, was was only a roll of um, hay so it is that kind of people and then they took me to other places who are equally poor equally poor. and through my work with probini foundation and partition document and center we have been welcomed in bangladesh by hindus by muslims by christians and buddhists okay, let, yeah, well let me let me side track uh, slightly in terms of uh, your book and the kind of language that you have used and uh, it uh, it feels like you have managed to convey some complicated and multi-layered experiences of people in a very simple uh, easy flowing language so how was this process now uh, talk to us as an author because you are gathering information you are listening to stories of all these people and then uh, you don't want to express them in a way that would take away the spirit of uh, sure. uh, the protagonist uh, that is always a difficult part but i have tried to do but first of all when i travel i 
I travel like a journalist, I, I take notes, I have a notepad so I can fall back on this. One thing I must say in this book, all the facts, all the stories are real, but all the names and names of the villages are fictitious. Because I have, as I mentioned here, I have no power to protect them. So they have told me many of their good stories and mostly lots of painful stories. So, so, so let, let, let me uh, seek your permission and jump into this page 169. I'll just read few lines uh, where uh, you are referring to um, this narrative and as you are being told, our elders, so I'm, I'm reading what is within the quotes. Yeah. Um, our elders used to tell us that at all costs, we must maintain friendship with our Muslim neighbors. They would say that those Muslims are like our brothers. They were Hindus like us some years back. Nalini brushed up his memory with a bit of personal discussion with the rest of the group. The headmasters, the teachers, the Hindu political leaders told our young hot-headed boys not to hit the Muslims back, not to use anti-Muslim slurs even when they insult us. Be like Sri Chaitanya. Situation was very tense. We felt that it might explode any day, but we didn't know how. Most of those leaders would warn our extremist Hindu boys to behave properly. Now, uh, give us some backdrop of where uh, this uh, reference is coming from. And many times we feel that history uh, has lessons. Has, have, do you see, have, have we learned some lessons from what you were uh, described uh, in terms of these experiences? Very tough question. Uh, first, first one, where this is coming in the context of, 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 of an anti-Hindu pogrom. So it, it is happening and this is in a Hindu majority district because in Bangladesh there were many, many areas where the Hindu majority, even now, just like as India, there are many, many areas where Muslim majority. So here they're hot-headed people who young boys wanted to hit back. The others are constraining. So it is in that context, but more recent ones. Um, now, whether we have learned from history, I would say Indians, uh, Hindus have not, we have, we do not learn from history. Uh, that's why we had 47 partition killings. We had killings in 71. Uh, okay, in sir, uh, I, as a child, I was probably nine years in 1971. And whatever memories I have through newspapers or a little bit of what we were taught in school is it was considered as a matter of pride for India. We were celebrating victory of Indira Gandhiji's leadership that we uh, managed to help yeah, the yeah, nation. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. But later on, uh, through your book, we come to know of the sufferings uh, which uh, were there for, m if not millions of people, thousands yeah, of people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Absolutely, that is a narrative. But on the other hand, you have to know absolutely tremendous courage for Mrs. Gandhi. I have, I have hats off. No question about it. Uh, she was a true leader and and uh, and, uh, and somebody with deep foresight. Um, having said that, but in India, the left opposed it. I myself witnessed actually there are stories here in Calcutta which I witnessed where the communists who mostly were refugees themselves a few years ago is chanting slogan um, uh, Indira Mujib Ek Hai, Indira Yahya Ek Hai. So I asked my my refugee friend who was marching in Calcutta, if how could a killer and savior be the same person? It's Yahya was massacring millions and millions of people. How could that be true? And how could Yahya Khan, who was killing millions of people, and Mujibur Gandhi, who, who won the election, could be the same? And if that is the truth, how could these people have come to India to live? and but not to live in their own homeland in Bangladesh. This is the, uh, so I do raise that question. Um, uh, but also most people even don't know that vast majority of the, in my research finds out, vast majority of the three million key people killed in Bangladesh were minority Hindus. Every secular Muslim 
in Bangladesh was target. But all Hindus, over 25% of the population, actually even, even Yahya Khan in his, one of his depositions later on during Hamidu, Hamidu Commission report um, of Pakistan says they asked the, asked the uh, military officers whether there was an order to exterminate Hindus because the term was used in the military context. So we are talking about most Indians don't know most, but Bangladeshis are very aware of it. Muslims, so uh, I, I, I take liberty again and I um, connect uh, viewers with uh, page 236, 237 of your book. Uh, and you would give us the context. I'll just read a few lines. We believe in Hindu-Muslim cohabitation. Yeah. Yet, we aren't allowed to talk about Ramana, Kali, Mandir and killing and burning alive of Hindu children, devotees, monks and nuns. Mukherjee added this lecture I have heard from my other fundamentalist party activist brother who has risen through the rank in the party. I've asked them, if you have no religion, why have you gone to Hindu India? If you are equidistant from Hindus and Muslims. Why don't you live in your Muslim homeland and with the poor oppressed caste Hindus? Strangely, all of their parents, grandparents, great grandparents have worshipped at Ramana Mandir for centuries. My pain even increased as my editor brother first told me back in 1971, then again in 2000 that those Ramana atrocities were lies against Muslims. Few years later he changed his line and said that we cannot publish this publish it as good journalists, we must censor some news. Uh, give us some background of what is this context here? Well, uh, of course the debate uh, there. Um, uh, now, uh, the discussion of this thing that, that this is a censorship that India has imposed and West Bengal has imposed on, on all of these, these things, but not in Bangladesh. Bangladesh is a lot freer country in that context. Now, Ramna is probably the oldest Kali Mandir in the subcontinent. Some people say it is goes back to first millennium. Some people say only 600 or 400 years old. Either way, it's one of the oldest institutions. During, during Pakistan, Bangladesh liberation, it is the Pakistan army and Bengali Islamists came, first dynamited that. And then right around the Ramna Kalibari, you had Kali Mandir, you had, you had Ma, Ma Anandamai Ashram and there, was a, and, and there was a lots of cows were there, Gavis. So, so actually if you go there, now you will see there is a plaque as to what 100 people were killed, were murdered. First they were asked to slaughter the cows, they, they, they refused. Then they slaughtered the cows and it is said then Pakistan army soldiers forced uh, flesh on their mouth and as they say they would not uh, some people say their tongues were pulled out they were shot they made a heap of all these people some still alive then they set it on fire so if you go uh, there was a citizens commission uh, that was established by a very famous um, lawyer Muslim gentleman um, and they, then they took testimony and now we have a plaque saying 100 names are there. You have that plaque in my previous book called Empire Slash Casualty which documents number of people who lost from Bangladesh uh, since partition. So there I have a picture of that plaque and if you go to Dhaka you could see. Ramna is in the center of the city. Um, maybe it's slightly uh, away from the main context. but. Somehow, India being uh, a country as it is, unity and diversity uh, being the strength of India and uh, each state has its own unique uh, culture, Absolutely. its dresses, yeah. its food. food uh, so, though, though we are uh, one nation, but what way people suffer in Jammu and Kashmir, many times rest of the India is not that much familiar. The same way, the way in East Bengal some people suffered, the rest of India is not that much familiar. True, true. I mean, I'm sorry to say that I am very critical of what I call Hindu mind. Not, it doesn't have to be anti-Muslim or anti-anything, anti-white, no. But 
it is it allows us to divide amongst brain amongst ourselves because it is true when I talk when I travel uh, people often ask what is your work language what caste I do not know what caste I am I don't even want to know I don't believe in that um, but we have a power to compartmentalize us more so than anybody else and a lot of people have given a lot of explanations which I am not willing to accept and for me that is less than human if we cannot care about your people and other people what kind of humanity is there so so yes you okay, are so very how kind. history um, is a way to build that bridge which would increase your awareness about sure, how sure, how you sure, should sure, care sure, for sure, others sure, sure, sure. you know that's why there is an english english saying if you do not learn from history history repeats itself so we have this 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 because we have not learned from anything so 47 71 then we have killings you know every few years mm, you have all kinds of killings um, this is this is very true and that that you ask that we are absolutely can compartmentalize ourselves into a family or a village or a language or a caste and, and uh, allow me to also uh, share uh, this thought uh, the world that we have started uh, finding ourselves now uh, we care about our uh, comforts uh, we care about uh, career we many times uh, have conditioned ourselves to think that things are going to be all right all the time and all that I am required to do is to uh, take care of my needs, my family's needs. So that is uh, the general notion is that. Do you think that should be questioned? Sure. I would say, but on the but this is also anti-contradict, anti-Hindu or anti-thinking. On the other hand, Hindu philosophy, if you talk about Hindus, I will talk about rest of India. Because Jains and Buddhists more are similar philosophy. We also talk about that we have to care about other people. Right. We have to... Actually, we talk about the biggest salvation on when we, when we give up all our assets for something else. And that's the real contradiction. Even when you talk about Gita, Hindus taught it to be talk, taught, people say we are one of the least militant people. But if you read Gita, we are talking about fighting against, against, um, against your enemy. You, you have to take up your arms, even sometimes is, that is your guru. Or your, your, your cousins. Okay, when I'm saying what I just said, I'm not uh, referring to a particular religion. I'm sure. talking about the general mind of this sure. era, sure. which uh, some, of, uh, some of them may have more religious uh, consciousness, but mostly we just, we just see that true. we are what we are no. as human beings. But true. But on the, at the same time, I would say we consider America to be very materialistic. But see how much Americans donate for other people, other suffering. We talked about Probini Foundation. We have people completely unknown, white Americans, black Americans, uh, who have never been to India coming and giving us donations to help educate our children there. Uh, all our big universities in America run by donations. That means uh, they, they get huge donations people. If you look at other successful communities, nation but you'd find that that is true uh, so it, it, it that's not only comfort but people have to go beyond this uh, and that is ingrained in American culture um, so so we do have to if we we just cannot pick and choose what we like about different we can pick and choose okay so as a as an author and someone who is constantly researching on this theme Professor Chi, you probably must have come across many people whose sufferings brought tears to your, li your eyes and when you uh, remember uh, that particular narration, uh, you, you still feel oh, a sense of helplessness or something. Sure, sure. Yes, there are times it brings uh, tears to my eyes. I do, as I have written, uh, the family of Sh uh, Shubha, uh, how actually she perished how somebody wanted to kidnap her daughter who was barely a teenager and how somebody is trying to protect. Then, then I also bring in and the story about uh, Saroja. I bring in story of the headmaster whose family stayed back in Bangladesh hoping the son who was lost during a pogrom 
would come back. And then I talk about, uh, about somebody who lost everything during another pogrom goes back from India to, to live in Bangladesh. Uh, because, because that's what she thinks. Now she has found a family, uh, which is the headmaster's family, who she, whom she then starts calling Baba and Ma. And they accept her. It's a grown-up woman. who. So this is from somebody I have seen myself wanting, longing, longing to go back uh, because she has lost everything back home. And unlike people who would like to go back to the Muslim majority Bangladesh, she is a Hindu, she is going back to live there um, uh, in memory of her own children, own, own husband, own parents. So yeah, those. You also have uh, stories of uh, protectors. Uh, let's sure, talk sure, about sure, sure, uh, sure, sure. that. That kind of uh, brings back our faith in humanity and goodness uh, uh, from all walks of people. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. here are mm, s references of some protectors. Also. Yeah, yeah. Now, first part of this thing, I use narratives of two people. Uh, Nolini Hardy is a very obvious caste family who and then Wadud family. These two are friends and these two are, one is Hindu, one is a Muslim who are trying to protect each other uh, and protect the, the tradition in the village. In the village, people are very conscious about their own tradition, even pre-Islamic tradition. So they are trying to protect, we have that. But also, even in my other project, in uh, there, there are many places we mentioned, even in partition documentation project, I have interviewed people, their narratives are available in YouTube. There are quite a few people who have really risked their lives to protect Hindu minority in Bangladesh. Though uh, they, they wish they could be more successful, but they have not. Uh, you will see many people, Shahariyar Kabir, who himself was to be killed. Uh, there were attempts in his life uh, while trying to give relief to Hindu minority in North Bengal, not Bangladesh. Yeah. There are other people. So let me uh, share a story of one uh, boatman, Mr. Abdus Shahid, uh, uh, who is a Muslim, which appeared in the Bengal Daily, Bengali Daily. And you have it on page 464 on in your book. Uh, it, it's a it very, goes, very uh, painful, yeah, very, yeah, very it, painful. It goes like this. I had my boat docked at Nadirabad, Nadirabad. Nadirabad, yeah. Why don't you read it? For no, that? no, you read it. It was in the middle of the night around 1 a.m. All of a sudden, I saw a group of 15 to 20 people force Birja Bala and, Birja her, five, Bala. Birja Bala and her five children into my boat. They were scared to death. They couldn't even cry. Some had their clothes on, others didn't. Kidnappers asked me to row the boat. I got scared too. The boat arrived at the destination of uh, Dhopajuri Bill. Riverbank. They had already brought drums, salt and lime. Killers unloaded them, Birja Bala family. All of a sudden, I saw that they were about to chop Birja Bala. Birja Bala cried at the pitch of her voice. She was begging again and again by clutching the legs of the killers. Killers then cut her into pieces and stuffed her into a drum. After that, they cut into pieces the elder daughter. Niyoti. Niyoti. Uh, from distance, I watched the younger children begging for their lives over and over again. I can't express that into words. Tears came out of my eyes. I called for God, O oh Allah, why did you bring me here? I was feeling dizzy. There was nothing that could be done. The killers buried both the drums on the dry river bed and asked me to row the boat. Nine days later, the drums were discovered accidentally. When a school headmaster's boat collided with one of the drums, when the river bank got flooded and so on and so forth. Yeah, it is one of the very painful when I read this myself. It, by the way, this, this comes from a, as you can see the footnotes, it comes from a Bangladeshi newspaper. newspaper. Uh, there are almost every paper printed it, how sad the plight of Bangladesh Hindu minorities are there. That there was a tiny bit of property which is smaller than probably this, this room and somebody wanted them to give that property and go away to India. And they said, we have nothing. Why should you go to India? We have, the, we have not, there's nothing for us. This is our home. We have lived there for generations. So then this is a story. The guys who wanted to, to take them and kill them. Um, and when I read this, I realized next time when I go to Bangladesh, I have to go and pray to her, 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 her village 
um, to say, listen, we, the privileged uh, people, affluent people who fled and left these people uh, at the mercy of other people. So indeed, when I went to Dhaka, I asked my contacts and they found a, one of my uh, friends, a Muslim uh, taxi driver who took us there. He said, I know, sir. And there is a memorial, which is the nice part in Bangladesh. At least they have the, in India, you will, not have, you will not have found that memorial. Because in India, in Bangladesh, in Calcutta, right in front, 50 years from my home, there were 20 Hindu monks and nuns were murdered, first beaten, then set on fire, and then they were killed. There's videos, and, and, but not one has been arrested. This is in the heart of Calcutta in Baliganj, 700 years from Goryahat. But in Bangladesh, there is a memorial of these seven people. The, f the father was murdered before. Um, so, so yes, so I, so, I went so uh, looking, looking at the time concern, probably we will move towards uh, the concluding part of our conversation and uh, I see uh, the contents of your book, uh, they are laid down in a very uh, interesting pattern. You begin with uh, Shivarani joins the mother chapter, in the middle is the vanishing act chapter and uh, the concluding side uh, brings us to the chapter, the Ashirbad. Uh, formal engagement ceremony. Somehow, uh, with the word Ashirbad, one gets the impression of uh, moving towards hope, moving towards uh, uplifting uh, side of life. Is that conscious or that just happened? It is conscious. I I am an optimist person. I hope things should be better. So I did write that in mind. And, and last chapter in search of Kali Kapoor, is also when when one of the one of my um, characters, a woman, who returns back with the family who came to visit India, Hindu family, headmaster's family, and going back into Bangladesh to live where she has lost her entire family during a pogrom, uh, because now she says, "I have found a mother and father who sheltered me," and then then she finds finds a, a person who thinks probably was a child that was lost during this uh, one of the attacks in the family and now a grown man in his 20s. So yeah, I, I shouldn't be giving up the, all <laughs> these things, but I do want to be optimistic. Okay, tell me what do you expect readers uh, to gather from your book? Uh, is uh, there any take-home message uh, from writer's uh, point of view that you would like readers to be benefited from this book? Sure. One of the things people should, should find how people struggle for survival. People who cannot speak how they are surviving or not surviving. Other thing is that how even with our, with our even people with very modest means, physically or monetarily, they can help each other. Just not by abandoning somebody, but if you stay, help somebody who is suffering, you could change the situation a lot. You could be, you could be um, really a very um, change for the better. So, change for the better is a very, very important uh, phrase for us and when we uh, look at uh, India today, uh, near 26 January, when you look at all that you have learnt uh, through your study of uh, the partition uh, in this book, which is Mukti, uh, Free to be Born Again, Partitions of Indian Subcontinent, Islamism, Hinduism, Leftism and Liberation of the Faithful. Um, Am I allowed to say Please. Where, it, where it is available? Yeah, yeah, yeah. why not? Yeah. Why not? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I am pleased to say that b this book is available in, uh, in the internet through any of the bookstores from, from Barnes & Nobles to Amazon to other companies are marketing it as well as we will have it available at our partition center office in Jamaica, Queens, New York City. But otherwise people who have already bought uh, have found out uh, from from internet sites, it is available there. Okay, uh, this just a small this leftism is it 
coining a word by you or it is frequently no, leftism used? has been there for a long time people have used the word leftism uh, amongst many isms um, that that there is a leftism um, not not used on uh, but it has been used a lot you know what you have done in your title it could offend some uh, islamism or hinduism i'm i'm just saying in a yeah, lighter way but um, Leftism is uh, used uh, in the same sequence with religion. True, true. So, uh, it is the religion. leftist would find it of offending, no, <laughs> offending no, no. that you are. Yeah, we were converted by leftism to atheism. I mean, that's athe that's atheism too. I mean, uh, and those who are hardcore, they themselves have said very obnoxious things, which is not much different from other religious extremists. So I do. I, I you know, we all evolve. I have evolved myself. To seeing how even how intolerant they can be, even during the 35 years rule in West Bengal by the leftist. So that's that's the part we bring in, and how intolerant they were. There are hundreds of examples of that. Okay, out of many many good things that has happened in India after independence, after becoming a republic of its own, what is it that you find uh, very very impressive or? Some uh, thing that you feel excited about that, oh, this is how India has transformed. <coughs> yeah, yeah. One of the very, very important things there is, remember at 47, there are many Westerners says India is going to fall apart because of so many languages, religion. This is never going to work. Uh, but that itself has survived 67, 60, uh, all these years. Um, in spite of constant instigation from across the border or for, for a time when it was a pariah nation uh, from the western point of view. That itself is a very, very big achievement. People do not, in India, people do not talk about, uh, in general, they, are, they do not talk about, uh, I mean, the, the religion, they are very religious, but religion doesn't play as important role as you see in many neighboring countries. It's important. But, but people identify as Indians and you go to a place, even in New York or in Delhi or in Calcutta, in one office there will be 20 linguistic people. People do not, do not um, I mean they, they, they work together, they live together and I myself I consider that to be a product of, of one of the benefits of Hinduism in the sense Hinduism is extremely tolerant and pluralistic religion. So it allows for various ideas to survive in spite of an onslaught from outside, so it has survived. So that is a really very, very um, big achievement. Look at Europe, even after a few years of, of one nation per se without, without passport, uh, now it is, it is strained and people are saying it's already going to fall apart. Uh, but, but so Absolutely, that's very wonderful. So wonderful. Um, my guest today, uh, Professor Sachi uh, Dastidhar, uh, founder of Provini Foundation, as well as ISPAD, which is Indian Subcontinent Partition Documentation Project, and author of uh, this uh, wonderful uh, book, uh, uh, Labor of Love uh, of Over 18 Years, uh, sharing uh, glimpses of the book as well as his perception and understanding uh, based on his research as well as uh, first-hand encounters uh, with uh, many people whom he uh, himself puts in three broad categories, refugees, uh, survivors and uh, protectors. Um, in spite of all the sufferings, uh, there is light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, that's what uh, this uh, book teaches and brings out in a way which could be very, very uncomforting at times as you uh, go through experiences of people who have uh, suffered in a way which uh, is beyond our imagination. Um, we thank you very much and commend you for what you have uh, done uh, so far for the community and for increasing awareness amongst us about our own history. Thank you. Uh, thanking thank you him uh, and again greeting him on um, Republic Day of India, uh, this January 2016. This is Ashok Vyas. Namaskar.